Good evening. Biologists have described over 400 different species of sharks. And for many people, the, the word shark evokes images of uh, great white sharks, scenes from the movie Jaws, shark attack, and fear. Consider these two statements. I never swim in the ocean because I'm afraid of sharks or shark attack. And number two, I never take a bath or a shower because I fear injury or death in the bath or shower. <laughs> well, many people would, as, as the chuckles indicated, many people would think number one is, the, uh, is kind of reasonable and number two is kind of ridiculous. But compared to the probability of death by shark, you're 7,000 times more likely to die or uh, to be injured in the bath or the shower, and you're 700 times more likely to die in the bathtub or the shower. The point of that is that we all engage in activities daily that are far riskier than taking a swim in the ocean and the chance of you encountering a shark. Now, there are some people that will say, hey, I don't swim in the ocean or take a bath or a shower because I'm afraid of sharks. <laughs> now, again, you know, we, we chuckle. But that, exempl <laughs> that exemplifies an attitude or a perception that's out there. And let me give you a real-life example. I did a radio talk show in Florida a number of years ago. And callers would call in and ask the shark man questions. And by the way, I prefer to be called Dr. Shark Man. <laughs> so folks would call in and ask questions. They, I had a lot of good questions. I remember two of them in particular to this day. The first one was a, uh, a lady called in and said, if I fall out of my boat while, while fishing in the Gulf of Mexico, will I be immediately eaten by sharks? Seriously. I didn't know how to respond to that, truthfully. It took me so much by surprise. The second one was, if I'm swimming in a freshwater lake in Florida, and I knew the lake, the lake had no connection with the ocean whatsoever, and he asked, uh, what are my chances of being bitten while swimming in this freshwater lake, by, bitten by a shark? Well, uh, zero, nada, zilch, like none. <clears throat> So what are my goals for this presentation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe some really cool characteristics that sharks possess. And by doing that, I hope that maybe you'll, you'll, you'll leave here with, a, with a, some appreciation for how neat they are. and Maybe share the enthusiasm that I have for this group. Number two, I'm going to tell you about some research that I'm doing that's addressing declining shark populations. Number three, uh, number three, I'm going to suggest something that you can do to perhaps help. And then finally, number four, I hope to change your perception of sharks a little bit, maybe, maybe a lot. So some, oh man, too many years ago, 40 years ago, when I started working with sharks, I became interested in them because of some really cool characteristics. And I'm going to describe some of those to you now. Electrosensitivity. Sharks are able to detect electric fields. This is a sensory modality that we as humans really have no appreciation for whatsoever. Sharks can detect the electric field that emanates from the beating heart of its prey. Obviously, they, they detect prey and they, they use that sensory system to locate prey. So that's, 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 that's mind-blowing to me. Even more so is the sensitivity of this system. Sharks can detect electric fields as low as 5 nanovolts per centimeter. That's a 5 with 8 zeros in front of it, volts. To give you a better appreciation for what that, re what that represents, if we take a regular flashlight battery one and a half volts, and we connect the poles 
and we allow current to flow. That will produce an electric field. You can reduce the strength of this electric field by separating the poles and increasing the distance over which that current is flowing. To attain a five nanovolt per centimeter electric field strength, you would have to stretch the poles of this battery from Oxford to Biloxi, Mississippi, over 300 miles. That's the sensitivity that these animals have. So electrosensitivity, really cool characteristic of sharks. <clears throat> Biomimicry. Biomimicry refers to the, the idea that we as biologists, scientists, go out into nature and we observe characteristics. We come back to the laboratory and we copy it in the lab to try to solve some human problem, treat some human condition. The Speedo Corporation produced a swimsuit called a shark skin. Some of you may be aware of this. They produced it after observing that sharks have a really rough textured skin. I've been slapped by sharks many times. One slap and you have a big raspberry on your leg. That rough and texture makes sharks better swimmers. It, it improves the hydrodynamics of the swimming. Speedo produced these suits. They sold them for big money, I'm told. I don't have one. And the swimmers that had those suits in the 2008 Olympics brought home significantly more medals than those that did not. My understanding is that those suits have actually been banned from competition now. So we can observe characteristics in nature, sharks included, bring them into the lab and solve problems that, that uh, humans are, are saddled with. New drug development. It has recently been discovered that sharks have a much smaller antibody than the normal sized antibody. And these things are cleverly called small antibodies. <laughs> so what is an antibody? Antibodies are the molecular defenders of your body. You have a, say you have a disease causing organism or cell in your body. Antibodies come in and bind to it and they and they improve the body's ability to get rid of these, of these disease-causing agents. The beauty of these small antibodies is that we can attach a drug to these things. And this is already being done, by the way. And that small antibody, because it's small, actually can enter the cell of the disease-causing organism. And it can infiltrate further into the tissues to more specifically target diseased areas. At this, at, as we speak, there are some 40 different drug therapies that are being developed that are using small antibodies. Ecosystem balance. Most of us know, I hope a lot of us know, that ecosystems exist as these complex connections between organisms. You have a community of organisms. We'll think of sharks or predators at the top. Those animals feed upon their prey and their prey of the shark's prey, etc. Complex interactions that create this food web. When we remove sharks from those systems, you will see a rippling down effect deleterious changes in that, in that ecosystem, in that community. We are presently removing sharks in that very fashion from, our, from the world's oceans at an unprecedented rate. Over the past 30, 40, 50 years, we have seen 80, 90, 99% decline in shark populations around the world. Why is this decline taking place? It's very simple. We're taking them faster than they can replace themselves. Why are we taking them? For food. There are places in the world that are protein poor. 
And that's something that we're probably not going to ever be able to stop that. As long as you manage those populations carefully, that's not a problem. But there are two other things that are really contributing to population declines, which are very addressable. Number one is bycatch. Number two is finning. Bycatch is the unintended capture of a non-targeted species. That's like if you're a fisherman and you're trying to catch largemouth bass with your rod and reel. And you catch one bass, but you catch 10 catfish. You don't want those catfish. Those are bycatch. Bycatch is a problem across all fisheries. And, and I should say it's a huge problem across fisheries. There are some 50 million sharks taken annually as bycatch. And many, the majority of those, do not survive the stress of capture and handling, unfortunately. So that's contributing to population decline. My research focuses on a fishery. It focuses on the tuna and swordfish fishery in the Gulf and Atlantic and bycatch within that fishery. Here we have a, a typical leader from the tuna swordfish fishery. And if I could get a volunteer to come up and put this hook in their mouth, <laughs> and don't everybody rush the stage all at once now. This is a, tu a typical leader, 300 pound test, tough stuff, baited hook, put the bait on, tuna swordfish, take the bait, and they're caught. The problem is, well, you probably see the problem. A baited hook floating out in the ocean, a shark's going to take that bait. Shark takes this bait, and that shark may be on this line for five or six hours before it's pulled in. And the fisherman will let them go, but that shark is toast by the time it gets to the boat because of the length of time it's spent on this line. So this is a really good product. It works quite well. By catch with, with this is, is terrible. So here's what I've been researching. <clears throat> One of my research projects, and it's an ongoing project. And this is tangled. This is a new kind of leader. It's called ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, which that doesn't mean much to, to you guys. It doesn't mean much to me either, for that matter. <laughs> this is 300-pound test, just like that line. But here's the difference. If you... If you put a load on this line and you stretch it, it's got a tangle and it's not supposed to be there, and you stretch it and you take a sharp edge and you pass it across that line, it'll pop just like that. So we bait these and use these instead of the, the monofilament line. Well, hmm, where do we see a lot of sharpened edges? In the mouth of a shark. Shark comes along, takes the bait. Its, its teeth invariably contact this line, separates the line. The shark swims away. Now it's got a hook in its mouth. And that, that will corrode out over a fa fairly short period of time. But that's far less stressful than that animal being on that, on that monofilament for five or six hours. So we're convinced... And I'm still working on this. I'm convinced that if we substitute this kind of leader, this is a simple change that fishermen will accept. If we substitute this kind of, of, kind of leader for that monofilament, we'll see many more shark bite-offs and a, a significant reduction in bycatch in the tuna and swordfish fishery. Finning. You may have heard of this before. Finning is the cruel, wasteful removal of the fins of a shark. The body is discarded. Why? The fins are much more valuable than the flesh. What is it used for? Shark fin soup. You may have heard of that. <clears throat> Finning is illegal in the United States. It's illegal in many parts of the world. Unfortunately, because the fins are so valuable, finning is taking place in places where, one, there's no law at all, or two, there are laws, but they're totally unenforced. And here's the other problem. Those fins that are being removed by that heinous method are 
finding their way into U.S. markets. And they're being traded in the United States. So I testified before Congress last year in support of the U.S. Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act. This act effectively says that the U.S. will no longer allow the trade of shark fins. If you are so inclined, go online. You can find lots of information about it. Read about this. And if you support this legislation, please contact your congresswomen, your congressmen. Tell them you support the legislation. So final words. It's going to take all of us working together, politicians, scientists, the public, fisheries managers, to prevent these amazing animals from becoming members of this club of the extincted. Extincted is not a word, but I just kind of like it. <laughs> Extinction is like discovering ancient texts written in a language that we cannot yet decipher, then destroying them all. Who knows what questions would have been answered, what mysteries solved, what inspiration would have been provided by the words written there. When we drive an organism to extinction, we lose a vast wealth of information that can never be recovered. Scientists are in agreement that we are quickly approaching a moment in history where we will have to make critical decisions about preservation and conservation of our natural resources. I hope, I pray that we will not miss our moment. Thank you.